All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, it's uh, definitely an honor to be here uh, with you all at Outlier. Um, definitely feeling humbled to be here. So I want to share a few questions that have been top of mind for my working group. How might we represent data in ways that provides value and insight to anyone, regardless of their ability? How might we create accessible data experiences that meet people where they are? And these are some of those top of mind questions that my data accessibility working group at Google has been striving to solve as we've been aiming to make charts, graphs, and visualizations accessible. And this is pretty important to us because data viz is prominently featured in a lot of our products. So for example, uh, for those folks who use search and news, we use data viz to help them quickly find answers to questions they might be asking of the product. For people who use our hardware devices, our mobile devices, our wearables, it's very likely that data visualization is a part of their everyday lives. And typically they're using charts and graphs to track things like physical activity and even monitor chronic health conditions. And even for our enterprise customers, we use visualizations to help people make better, more well-informed business decisions. And of course, this has worked for us because visualizations really exploit the human visual system. They, as we know, they leverage that core capability a lot of us have to gather, accumulate, and process information presented by the environment around us through all the images we see. And of course, through that capability, we're almost instantly able to spot trends, patterns, and outliers in all of those images. So visualizations tap into these core capabilities that enabled us to really survive as a modern species for hundreds of thousands of years. Now, while a lot of us can enjoy this visualization in its entirety, we can appreciate the value it provides, we can glance at the insights that are available through it. For some people, this is going to be the experience. For other people, this might be the experience. And for people who are blind, this is going to be the experience. And in all of these cases, we're now missing out on all of that value, all of those glanceable insights that are provided to those people who can see the visualization in its entirety. So of course, we know, according to stackexchange.com, over 4 million people in America rely on assistive technology to consume web content. We also know, according to the CDC, that over 41 million people have some sort of disability in the US. And then even zooming out, let's think more about those folks who might not be using assistive technology that we need to consider. Some of those folks with vision disabilities. For example, we know that over 300 million people worldwide have color deficient vision. So this is, we're on the order of millions here, and this is a lot of people that we need to consider when we're creating accessible data experiences. So way back when, when I started working in accessibility, I'm gonna just share a very early lesson to learn here that this is difficult. Sure, it's easy to pass compliance and check off all those compliance boxes. And of course, it's easy to throw a chart into a dashboard, but to create a useful data experience is much more difficult. It requires some knowledge of data visualization and to create an experience that's accessible and useful is also difficult. And now when you combine those two things into data accessibility, we're faced with a very tangled, gnarly mess of a design challenge. So what I'd like to share with you today is some of the lessons learned along the way in our pursuit of making charts, graphs, and visualizations not only accessible, but also useful. So to start, I wanna focus on visual design. And I'm going to address some lessons learned as we were pondering one, probably one of the most controversial topics amongst us, which is uh, accessible chart colors. And of course, this was a topic that was very popular, probably the most popular topic in our 2021 and 2022 Google-wide data viz office hours. So let's take a look at this example, this digital well-being chart. And I think we can all agree that this color palette might fit within the theme of digital well-being, it's calm, it's cool, it's collected, looks pretty good, right? Well, the fact of the matter is somebody with a protonopia condition is going to experience the chart like this. And now you'll notice the other category and the YouTube category 
uh, depicted by the upper two segments in this donut are nearly indistinguishable from one another. Now, let's take that a step further. Uh, for someone who can't see color at all, this is going to be the experience. And now you'll notice that the chart is almost entirely illegible because it's really difficult to delineate each of the categorical colors in this particular chart. In my humble opinion, it's time to bring back the data table because this chart is now a waste of screen real estate. So where do we go from here? So it's great to start with web standards. And if we think about that, web standards typically call for a minimum contrast ratio of three to one between a graphical color, like a chart element, and then all the neighboring colors around it. And that could be the background of the chart, that could be the um, neighboring chart color if we're dealing with a categorical chart with fills. And I think we can all agree that this chart is much bolder. I'm sorry, this palette is much bolder. It's more eye-catching. It's probably easier to see. So let's take a look at it now applied to a visualization. So again, nice and bold, um, much better than the initial donut chart that I shared. But if I were to tell you that the most important metric here is depicted or represented by the bottom red segments in each of the stacked bars, I think we can all agree that it's difficult to see. It's really hard to scan for those bar segments. So one thing we learned early on, and we're going to do a bit of a magic trick here, is we leaned into this idea of using darker outlines and a combination of lighter fills to draw focus in the chart. So I'm going to play some color compliant outlines around the upper blue segments. We're going to do a bit of a magic trick here. And now you'll notice your attention is now drawn down to the metrics that matter most. And this is something we really leaned into in terms of remaining compliant, but still enabling um, our teams to draw focus to the areas of the visualization, those metrics that matter most. So one of our early lessons learned was combining fills and borders because it enables you to focus on what matters. So let's go back to our donut chart. We're going to fix it real quick here. And boom. OK, I think uh, this looks a bit better. And uh, we have a nice balance of fills and outlines. And now we have a chart that's a little bolder and it meets those color contrast requirements. But color is only really one part of the story here because we need to think about using other sensory elements, other encodings. Because if you look at this, you still have to use color to associate the legend item with its corresponding segment in the donut. And the goal here would be to try our best to minimize our reliance on color to carry meaning here. So we thought about other encodings. We thought about using iconography, even textures, and as we started to design these new experiences, we couldn't help but wonder, are we adding additional chart junk here? And now there's a lot of great libraries out there, some that I really love that have amazing accessibility features. But as we started looking at what was out on the internet, um, we started to realize even patterns add some visual noise and visual vi vibration. And while a lot of these ideas would check the compliance boxes, we have to ask ourselves, are we still able to understand this chart at a glance? So one of the questions that we've been thinking about is how might we make charts accessible and meet those requirements while minimizing chart junk? And again, this is in the spirit of thinking about how accessibility might transcend compliance. So one way in which we can do this is really rely on the text. So we're going to update our donut chart again. And we're going to move our legend labels in line. And now they're directly associated with each of the donut segments. But there's sometimes we don't always have the luxury of or screen real estate to be able to show inlined legends like this. So let's take a look at a few other techniques that we've learned about. So in this particular instance, we're looking at a stacked area chart. Again, we leaned into that idea of using lighter fills and darker outlines. In this case, the outlines achieve the three to one contrast ratio with the uh, next neighboring category. And then so we can draw quicker associations between categories and the corresponding legend items, we added some quick shapes and icons in here. And in thinking about this color balance, again, we can use darker fills to draw focus to metrics that should be treated more prominently. Now, this is great for categorical charts with a limited set of categories. 
But I'm sure we've all experienced scenarios where we might have been facing a tangled mess of a categorical chart like we're seeing here on the left. And when we start adding these icons, these symbols, and using colors to delineate categories in this case, I feel like the chart gets out of control very quickly. Even for someone who's fully sighted, it's a bit more difficult to read. So we went back to some of those Edward Tufte fundamentals and we thought about using small multiples or spark lines because there's an accessibility benefit here and you can see it on the right. Not only is it easier for us to spot the um, individual trends for each of these categories, but we now have text associated with each of those categories, which is going to be great for a screen reader experience. And you'll notice we no longer have to rely on color to convey categorical meaning in this case. Even for data tables where we're showing status icons, we've been thinking a lot about how we represent status. And in this case, for someone who is red, green, colorblind, instead of using fills for all of the icons, we reserved the fills for the items that are in an error or failed state, those items that need your attention most. So regardless of whether or not you can see color, you can actually scan the table and these items should pop out at you first. So some of the challenges we've been facing here aren't as straightforward and we've looked in perhaps some unexpected places for some inspiration. So in some cases, we've taken inspiration from nature as we were thinking for some of our work, how to visualize weather patterns and radar images in 3D. We also took inspiration from printing processes like halftone dots to start experimenting with how we might reimagine a heat map with a dual encoding to meet accessibility requirements. And we also took inspiration from architecture and how, design, uh, how buildings are designed to optimize traffic flow to think about how we might show the direction in which data is flowing in a visualization. And in this case, we're using this nice animated inner circle here to show that this progress chart is actually filling up to 100% rather than draining down to zero. Now, with animation, there are other accessibility concerns that we should consider. But for the sake of this demo, this would work just fine to meet our visual design requirements. And then, of course, as we thought about interactive states and how we indicate mouse hovers, um, selected states, and even keyboard focus states, we had to think about these color contrast requirements. And one thing that we learned early on is that while we might have felt inclined to change the shade of color on the data ink itself, it was actually better to add visual elements around the data so that we wouldn't first obfuscate it, but also we could then just worry about enabling those new elements to achieve the contrast ratio with the background and instead of um, achieving it with all the different colors within the chart. And one interesting thing here is because we're using a different visual language to represent different interaction states, when they are collapsed on top of one another, imagine we have an item selected here and then you're also hovering on it, we can actually layer those states on top of one another in a nice accessible way. So we learned also through this process that it's much easier to meet compliance and create an experience that's actually useful when we consider accessibility first. It's much more difficult to retrofit these requirements to existing chart designs. It's a lot easier when we start to think about accessibility upfront, hence the name of this presentation, the accessibility first approach. And as we started to do that, we realized that we we're creating some really interesting newish chart experiences that even for people who are fully sighted, tap into those core pre-attentive processing capabilities that I mentioned earlier. So this is one case where accessibility was starting to benefit not only people who um, have disabilities, but also everyone in general. All right, so I talked a lot about visual design for part two. I wanna do a deeper dive into creating useful experiences with assistive technology. And there's a lot to unpack here. And I'm gonna just roll out with a lesson learned right out of the gate here. And that's to build a diverse team and really work with people who rely on assistive technology in their day-to-day -day lives. Work with people who have um, disabilities because we did this and it's something that really changed our approach to chart design in a really positive way. So some of the challenges that we faced and we were thinking about how to create useful assistive technology experiences started with navigation and chart structure and interaction. How might we structure a chart so that it's easy to navigate with a keyboard and assistive technology? And of course, this is something that's going to be helpful for people with limited motor skills. So some graphs and charts, as we can imagine, are very complex in nature. 
So let's take a look at this uh, visualization from LinkedIn. This is a visualization of someone's network and all of their connections. And I wanna do a bit of a design exercise. I wanna ask you, how might we navigate this with a keyboard? The first idea that might come to mind is, well, you can just tab through all the different uh, people or nodes within this network. But if you think about it, some people have hundreds of network connections, some people have thousands, and LinkedIn influencers probably have tens of thousands of connections. And as a designer of this experience, we have to ask ourselves, is it responsible of us to require our users to tab through thousands of nodes or people in this network only if they're trying to interact with something that might appear after this visualization on the web page? I think the answer to that is no. So how might we structure this visualization? Well, we could think of a hierarchical navigation here. If I go back to the example, you'll notice that color is used as an encoding and it represents different groups within this network. And these could be groups of people that worked at the same company. They could be groups of people that might have attended the same university or might be in the same trade organization. So perhaps we could tab through the different groups, select a group, and then tab through the people within that group. So it's a nice hierarchical structure, certainly reduces the number of tabs. Some other ways we might consider are using alternative keys. Perhaps when you land on the visualization, you could use something like arrow keys and just navigate to the, through the different nodes in the visualization organically. So that's one tab into the visualization, the next tab out, that solves the first problem highlighted, but then there's still a nice flat way to navigate this visualization. Now, if we think about the core purpose of a lot of network graphs, a lot of times they're used to help us quickly spot the most influential nodes on the network. In this case, the people with the most connections or the biggest influencers within this network. Perhaps we might consider using keyboard shortcuts to help us identify those people. And really the possibilities are endless. We're not gonna answer this today, but the way we would structure this experience ideally is in a way that helps people quickly find answers to questions they're asking of the data. And we thought a lot about this experience, not only in our dashboards, but even some of our complex visualizations like our flow diagrams and so forth as well. And in this example here, you can actually see how arrows are used to um, do synchronized brushing through charts in a dashboard. And even on the disk throughput example on the right, you can see how categories are coming in and out of focus and we're learning a bit more about them. Another thing that we've been thinking a lot about is how might we use text to prioritize data exploration and for surfacing insights. Now, this is easier said than done. I will say I'm excited about how um, all the rage around LLMs like ChatGPT and Bard could help us do this and tell us more about charts using text, but it's easier said than done. And as we know, a lot of charts serve different purposes. But thinking about how we might use text to provide more information about a, da about a data set is really going to help someone who can't see the visualization to begin with. Now, as I mentioned earlier, this all depends on the use case. So we know that some charts support an analytical user journey. And in a lot of cases, these charts aren't going to answer specific questions, but they might uncover the right set of follow-up questions to ask as you're conducting a root cause analysis on something or you're investigating something. Now, in this case, we might use text to prioritize affordances for drilling down into the data and navigating the, da the data and exploring it a bit more. Other charts are a bit more utilitarian in their nature. And we know as designers, the questions people are asking of this chart. So in this case, we might be able to surface a text-based insight that could be around, in this case, the um, performance of the stock, its recent trend. We could even perhaps highlight any unexpected spikes or dips in that, uh, that stock's performance. And then other visualizations used in journalism or executive presentations a lot of times have key takeaways already highlighted. And that's because they're meant to, to um, provide evidence to points that were made in the overarching narrative. They're supporting elements. And in these cases, we already know the key takeaways, therefore we might be able to use text to provide a summary of what's happening in this particular visualization. So um, how might we create, so uh, thinking about how we might use text to represent data, uh, there's a lot of different ways to think about it. 
it's really important to think about the core charts use case and how we might just help people along in their user journeys as they're leveraging the visualization. Now, all this talk of text conjures up a lot of thoughts around the screen reader experience. And I'm gonna share a bit more there. One thing we learned, and we designed these experiences with people who use assistive technology, is that it's important as you're navigating the chart with the screen reader to always orient people within the data set, indicating where you came from, where you are, and showing the possibilities of where you can go to. And at any step in this process, highlighting where you are in the data set and talking about what's happening in the data at that level of the visualization. And of course, it's always important to not reference visual cues like the red line or, or the blue bar or any of the visual elements because that probably won't mean anything to someone who is blind. Another lesson that we learned is a lot of people we worked with that use assisted technology really prefer to have access to the charts underlying data set. And this is just a good practice. It's just good for data integrity and being open and honest with your users. But we also found that for those folks who are using assistive technology, they're actually quite proficient in navigating a data table and even extracting some basic insights from it. Now, this isn't a silver bullet, so I would highly recommend testing it. And certainly this isn't going to solve all your chart accessibility issues. Some other things that I'd like to share is how might we leverage other senses when representing data? Here, data sonification comes to mind. And this is something that's a part of our everyday lives. If you used an elevator before, for example, you might have heard a chime sound as the elevator door opened and it arrived in your floor. I'm not sure if you're aware, but one chime actually means the elevator is going up and two chimes means the elevator is actually going down. So that's a nice elementary example of data sonification. And if you didn't know, now you know. It's a part of our everyday lives. Uh, we've been thinking a lot about how to apply that to data sets. And here's an example of data sonification applied to this line chart. So in this example, you should have been able to hear when the visualization, there was a spike in the data. And one thing that we're very interested in is how can we just integrate this into the core experience? How can we make it that's not something that you need assistive technology activated in order to access, but how can we take notes from or cues from that elevator example that I shared before? How can we play sounds on demand and just fully integrate it into the experience? So these are some of the early lessons that my working group has learned, and we're still, we're still striving to learn more about data accessibility. There's a lot of work to do, but I want to talk a little bit for the last part and how to make it happen. How do you put data accessibility into practice in your day-to-day -day work, and how might we prioritize it? Of course, in this economic climate, uh, we've seen a lot of DEI initiatives cut at different companies, um, but there are still ways around that. So even beyond the case for good web citizenship, sometimes it takes a business case to be able to do that. And we know, according to Annie Jean Baptiste's book, Building for Everyone, as of 2017, there was a $1 trillion market for consumers with disabilities. We also know that charts, graphs, and visualizations will also block accessibility audits. Giving access to the data table isn't good enough, but we must think about how to make the charts visual elements and um, all of its elements really fall into compliance. So then it just starts us down the path of thinking about this anyway. So what we did was when we started to think about how do we transcend compliance and actually create a useful experience, we actually started to realize across our company that there were other teams thinking about the same thing. And rather than spending our limited time and precious resources uh, solving problems that have already been solved by others, let's get a working group together where we can learn from each other. And as we started to learn from each other, we started to collect our design work, our resources. And at some point in time, we realized we had things that we could share with other folks in our organization, but even outside of our organization. So we started with some nice internal websites and resources, sharing our demos, some of which I shared today, some of our research, so people could get started thinking about this, and then in turn contribute back to our working group and help us propel some of our ideas forward. We externalized a set of guiding principles that will help people get started. I'm just gonna ping it in the chat here so y'all have the link. And this is for people who are casually drawing charts in PowerPoint and slides, 
and even those people who are starting out to make a robust component library. I will also say that in building a community around this, a lot of times the people we worked with were very busy focusing on their day-to-day -day work. So how do we get people to contribute information that can be shared um, on a voluntary basis? So it was important to us to build a strong culture and community and some lessons learned there were around we did a mix of different events in our weekly meetings. We had a healthy balance of guest presentations, design reviews. We set up time for brainstorming and informal conversation and collaboration. And this was nice because if you think about only doing presentations, there's a one-way channel of communication there. So we wanted to people to feel empowered to contribute and to become part of the conversation. In doing that, we found who our champions were, those people who were more likely to want to build an artifact and contribute to something. And then we put together a subgroup who was working on the guiding principles out of material design that I shared earlier among some of our other artifacts. Just a quick note about process. Design sprints were really important. We spent a ton of time at a whiteboard with our engineering partners, rapidly prototyping our ideas and then getting them in front of people who use assistive technology so we could test some of our assumptions and then empower them to contribute ideas back to how we would improve the experience for everyone. And I will say that that process inspired me to write a book all about UX drawing. And there's a wonderful forward, incidentally, by Manuel Lima, one of the greats in data viz. Um, but I, I just wanted to share this because this process was really essential in helping us solve a lot of these key problems. So if you're interested, I recommend picking up the book and you could read a bit more about how to engage your cross-functional peers in this design process. So I wanna leave you with a parting thought here because accessibility indeed transcends compliance and there's a lot to do. But if we start thinking about all those lessons we already learned and how we can forward that thinking, it's gonna take a lot of brains to really make great, useful, accessible data experiences. I want us to think about the devices we design for and those core capabilities they ship with. Take this example, this Nest Hub ships with the ability to um, provide a narrated response to your query. So think about that idea of how we can use text to provide um, an effective data experience and to help people understand the data set. It ships with the ability to play audio tones so we could think about using data sonification. And it also ships with a really nice high res screen. So think about all those visual design lessons learned that I shared earlier. But it's important to think about how we can bring these experiences together more holistically and create multi-sensory experiences that truly represent data and, and are useful, not only to people with disabilities, but to everyone. So I'd like you to join me in solving for this as we all strive to make our products more useful, inclusive, and accessible for everyone to enjoy. So I'd like to, to thank you for joining me for this talk. Um, I also want to acknowledge all the people that contributed to our guiding principles, the content that I shared today. I'm lucky enough to be here to represent the great work of a lot of accessibility analysts, data visualization experts, engineers, product manager, and uh, people with disabilities. So I'd be missing an opportunity if I didn't acknowledge that. And then finally, if you like the talk, feel free to follow me on social media. I'm pretty active on Twitter and LinkedIn, and we can keep the conversation going there. And finally, I'm just going to flash up the guiding principles as we move into the Q&A. Uh, so if you're interested in noting these or taking a quick screenshot of them, you can do just that as we move into the Q&A session. Thank you. One question came from Ben. What's an easy way to figure out the contrast ratio of different ah. colors? Um, yeah, so WebAIM has a really great contrast checker tool. Um, you could just do a quick Google search. There's several of them um, out there. Uh, let me just pull one up quick so I can um, ping it to the chat, if that's cool. Um, I want to say it's, uh, I use the WebAIM one, but there, there are a few more that are a bit more robust that you could use as well. Um, it would be uh, colorandcontrast.com. That's the one I was thinking of. Perfect. Yeah, I'll, I'll advocate for Color Shark. That is also a good one. It, it also will tell you what to, what to change, make the background darker, make it lighter. So exactly. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Thank I will you. say the, the caveat too there. I talked a lot about the 3-1 contrast ratio between chart elements and their neighboring colors. But when working with text, it's important to use a higher contrast ratio, like a 4.5 to 1 contrast ratio too. So I want to make sure that piece of it doesn't get lost too. 
Great, thank you. And then uh, Sarah asked, when you use alternative keystrokes to navigate visualizations, how do you think about communicating that to the relevant users and about ah. potential conflicts with the user's existing shortcuts? Yeah, so, so it's important to be respectful of those existing shortcuts. Um, especially in, in whatever, you know, product you're designing for, drafting the visualization into. A lot of times we'll provide access to a menu that tells you a little more about how you can navigate the graph in an accessible fashion. And also we'll bake some of those ideas into screen reader announcements too, uh, that give you more of an indication of how to interact with the, uh, the data experience. Perfect. Thank you so much for the quick Q&A. Wish we'd keep you longer, but um, really loved your presentation. And we'll uh, be sure to, if you have additional questions for Kent, he's already been in the chat, so I'm sure he'll be able to, <laughs> to answer those as well. So keep them coming. But thank you for your time. We so appreciate you being here. This was super fun. Thank you, everyone. And, and thanks for all the great questions. I really hope we can keep this discussion going. And if anything, I'm hoping I generated some more awareness on this important topic so we can continue to consider how to make charts, graphs, and visualizations accessible for everyone.